So this lecture is part of an online course on rings and modules and will be mostly about examples um, of unique factorization domains. So um, obvious examples of unique factorization domains are the ring of integers and the ring of polynomials over a field. Um, I'm not going to discuss those this lecture. Um, we're first going to look at the ring of Gaussian integers where you add the square root of minus 1 to z. So this is all numbers of the form m plus n i with m and n integers. And we saw last lecture that this is a unique factorization domain. We are also going to define the absolute value of m plus n i to be m squared plus n squared. Notice that this is the square of the usual absolute value you get in complex um, in, in complex analysis. Um, I'm doing this so that the absolute value of a Gaussian integer is still an integer. Um, and in particular we notice that if you have Gaussian integers then the absolute value of a b is the absolute value of a times the absolute value of b. And what we want to do is to discuss for the Gaussian integers what are the primes and what are the units. And then we're going to give some applications of, of um, unique factorization. Um, well, first of all, the units are quite easy to um, find. You remember something is called a unit if u times v is equal to 1 for some v. So it has an inverse. And you can check fairly easily that u is a unit in this particular case is equivalent to u having absolute value equal to 1. That, that, that uses the fact that this is multiplicative and this is not terribly difficult to check. Um, so if u is equal to x plus i y, this gives x squared plus y squared equals 1. So there are just four solutions of this. We have plus or minus 1 and plus or minus i. Um, this means that um, primes, uh, Gaussian primes tend to come in families of four because if x plus i y is a prime, then so is x plus i y times a power of i. So, so whenever you have a Gaussian prime, you have three others given by multiplying it by, 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 by units. So let's try and find the primes. So, so suppose x plus i y is, is some Gaussian integer. Well, you, we notice it divides x squared plus y squared, which is x plus i y times x minus i y. And you notice this is an ordinary integer. Well, you can write the ordinary integer as a product of prime. So if x plus i y is prime, um, we see that any prime, any Gaussian prime, x plus i y, must divide some ordinary prime, p. So we can find all the Gaussian primes just by factoring the ordinary primes into Gaussian primes. So let's try and do this. First of all, we notice the absolute value of p is equal to p squared. So either p is a Gaussian prime or p factors as a product of two Gaussian primes, x plus i, y times, well, the other one has to be x minus i, y, so you can easily check where this has, no, has absolute value equal to p because the only way you can write p squared as a product of two numbers bigger than one is p squared equals p times p. Well this implies x squared plus y squared equals p. So factoring p as a Gaussian integer is the same as trying to write p as the sum of two squares. Um, so let's just try and see how to do this. So let's take p, well if p is 2, we can write that as two squares. So we get it's 1 plus i times 1 minus i. So it's the product of two different Gaussian primes. Well, these aren't really di different because they differ by a multiple of i. Um, um, if, you, if, if you take i times 1 minus i, it's equal to 1 plus i. So we can really write this as 1 plus i squared times minus i. So 2 is up to a unit, it's just the square of a Gaussian prime. Well, 3 
cannot be written as x squared plus y squared, so 3 is a Gaussian prime. And of course we get plus or minus 3 and plus or minus 3i as, as, as a collection of four Gaussian primes. 5 can be written as a sum of two squares. So 5 is equal to 2 plus i times 2 minus i. And in, in the case of the factorization of 2, we saw that these two primes are really the same. Um, these two primes are really different. That they're, they're not units times each other. Um, in fact, um, each of these comes as a cluster of four primes because you can multiply it by units. So here we get um, um, minus 1 plus 2i minus 2 minus i and 1 minus 2i as what you can get from this by multiplying it by units. And similarly for this we get minus 1 minus 2i minus 2 plus i and 1 plus 2i. So here we get a cluster of four primes and here we get another cluster of four primes. So there are really eight primes dividing five in, in two groups of four. Um, seven is again prime because it's not the sum of two squares. Eleven is again prime, it's not the sum of two squares. And thirteen is equal to three squared plus two squared. So it's three plus two i times three minus two i. And it's similar to the case of five. So we see that sometimes primes split as a product of two Gaussian primes and sometimes they remain prime. And it's natural to ask which primes, which ordinary primes factor as Gaussian primes. Um, well if p is equal to x squared plus y squared we, we can look at this mod 4 and we know that any square is 0 or 1 mod 4. So both x squared and y squared are 0 or 1 mod 4. So this is 0, 1 or 2 mod 4. So we see that if p is congruent to 3 mod 4, this is p greater than 0, this implies p is um, a Gaussian prime. Um, on the other hand, if p is congruent to 1 mod 4, um, if, you, if you look at the the, the small number we did, we see that whenever p is 1 mod 4, it seems to split as a product of two primes. And this always happens. There's a very famous theorem by Fermat. Um, it says that if p is 1 mod 4, then p is the sum of two squares. In other words, it splits as a Gaussian, as a product of two Gaussian primes. Um, and we can prove this using unique factorization for Gaussian integers. First of all, we note that minus 1 is a square modulo 4. Um, if you've been to a course on number theory, you've seen this. If you haven't, you just notice that if you take the integers modulo pz and look at their group under multiplication, this is cyclic of order 4, sorry, not of order 4, of order p minus 1, which is divisible by 4. So it has an element a of order exactly 4, and then a squared has order 2, so is minus 1. So we have a squared um, is equal to minus 1 plus n times p for some prime p. Now, now we try and rewrite this in the Gaussian integers. So we have a squared plus 1 equals np, and now we can factor this. a plus i times a minus i is equal to np. Um, so p divides a plus i, a minus i, but does not divide a plus i or a minus i because it obviously um, a, a is an is is a, is a positive or negative integer so if you divide that by p you get a over p plus i over p and i over p is definitely not um, uh, uh, an integral multiple of i so p is not prime in 
the Gaussian integers. So you remember the definition of a prime says that if it divides a product, then it must divide one of those. Now we use the fact that the Gaussian integers are a unique factorization domain, so we see p is not irreducible. And if p is not prime, then it's not irreducible because we're in a unique factorization domain. So unique factorization domain, the irreducibles are prime. Um, so we're just sort of reversing this. So since p is not irreducible, we can write p is equal to x plus i y times something else. And this has to have norm, sorry, this has to have absolute value equal to p. So x squared plus y squared equals p. So um, this is, this is, one of Fermat's um, most famous theorems and one of the first um, really uh, non-trivial theorems he proved in number theory. Um, so we see it follows easily if you work with, with, with Gaussian integers. Um, now let's look at some other unique factorization domains. Um, next, instead of zi, which is z root minus one, why not look at z root minus 2? And we can see this is also a unique factorization domain. And we can prove this in pretty much the same way we did the Gaussian integers. So what we do is we draw a picture of z of i. So we have minus 1, 0, 1, 2. And here's the square root of 2 times i. And now all we have to do is we draw open unit disks around all elements of this ring. And if we do this carefully, we notice that the open unit disks um, still cover the complex plane. So the proof that this is a unique factorization domain is pretty much the same as for the Gaussian integers. Um, and just as the Gaussian integers um, and ends up looking at primes of the form x squared plus y squared, the, um, in this ring, instead we get, um, in order to decompose primes, you have to look at whether p can be written as x squared plus 2y squared. And otherwise, the theory for this ring is quite similar to the theory of the Gaussian integers. Well, if that worked for 2, let's try 3 and see what happens. So we're going to look at z root minus 3. So is this a unique factorization domain? Well, first of all, let's see what happens if we try to prove it. So what we do is, oops, needs to be a bit further down. If we draw a picture of z root minus three, it looks like this here, zero, one, two, and here's root three i. And now if we draw um, unit, um, circles around lattice points, we get something looking like this. And if you look very carefully, there's a point here. So this point is um, a half plus root 3 over 2i, which is not in any open unit disk. So the proof breaks down. Um, we can't prove that this is unique factorization domain by copying the proof for the Gaussian integers because there are a few points that aren't quite in these disks. And it sort of looks, I mean, they're very nearly in these disks. If we work with the closed disks instead of the open disks, then then the, the, then the plane would be covered. But it, this is enough to make the proof break down. In fact, this is not a unique factorization domain. So z root minus 3 is not a unique factorization domain. In fact, we can easily find examples that of, of non-unique factorizations. If we take 1 plus root minus 3 times 1 minus root minus 3, this is equal to 4, which is equal to 2 times 2. And these are all irreducible. And furthermore, they're not units times each other. The only units are plus or minus one. So here we have two different factorizations of four and 
the factorization into irreducibles just isn't unique. Notice, by the way, that, 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 that 1 plus root minus 3 is not prime. Here it divides 2 times 2, but it doesn't divide either 2 or 2. So this is an irreducible element that isn't prime. So um, we really did have to do a fair amount of effort to show that sometimes irreducibles are primes for unique factorization domains. Well, we can actually fix this quite easily. What we do is we take z root minus 3, and it's contained in z root minus 3 plus 1 over 2, and which is all numbers of the form m plus n root minus 3 plus 1 over 2. And it's not difficult to check that this is a ring for m n integers. It's still closed under multiplication. And now this is a unique factorization domain because if we draw this ring, it looks like the following. Um, what we've done is we take the points of z root minus 3 and then we add in all these extra points here. Um, and now you can see that this it is obviously going to be covered by unit disks because when we did z root minus 3 we covered everything except these purple points and if we add in these purple points and add unit disks around them that's obviously going to cover absolutely everything. So z root minus 3 plus 1 over 2 is a unique factorization domain. So somehow when we did z root minus 3 we sort of accidentally missed out some some complex numbers we really ought to have added to it and so, so, so we can make it much nicer just by adding a few extra complex numbers. Um, well this trick doesn't always quite work. Well uh, depends what you mean by this trick but whatever. So if we take z root minus 5 then this is not a unique factorization domain just as z root minus 3 wasn't. You can see 1 plus root minus 5 times 1 minus root minus 5 is equal to 2 times 3, and unique factorization just fails. So what happens if we try the previous trick? If we try z, 1 plus root minus 5 over 2. Well, the trouble is this ring is bigger than you expect. This is not equal to the numbers of the form m plus n um, times 1 plus root minus 5 over 2, because this is not closed under multiplication. Um, so in fact what we end up with here is, is it's, it's, not a, it's not a lattice in the complex plane and things really get to be a bit of a mess. Um, so, so this um, this collection of numbers here isn't a unique factorization domain because it's not even a ring. Um, um, so, I mean, you, well, obviously you can make this into a unique factorization domain by adding extra elements. For instance, you would just add all complex numbers and that would make it into a field. And so um, the, the question is whether you can make something into a unique factorization domain by adding a very small number of elements in some sense. Next, we can ask the question, what do the non-principle ideals look like? And I'm going to ask what do they look like in this ring z root minus 5 that we've got because we know it's not a unique factorization domain so it's not a principal ideal domain. And you know, but what are the non-principal ideals? Well um, let's first of all look at the principal ideals. So the principal ideals are going to look like a times z root minus 5 where a is going to be some complex number. Now z root minus 5 looks like a sort of rectangular lattice. Um, so here's 0, 1, 2, root minus 5 and so on. So the so, um, concept of a rectangular lattice is maybe not completely precise, but it's kind of obvious what is meant. If you, if you join up the nearest points, you get a rectangle and you can sort of translate these rectangles all over the place. Now if you take a times this lattice, well, when you multiply by complex numbers, um, um, you end up, the, the result is to multiply, rescale by the absolute value of a and um, rotate by the argument of a. 
So, so A times this lattice becomes, it might end up looking something like this. We, we might rescale it and rotate it. So here we have zero, this might be A, and here we would have A root minus five and so on. But it's still a rectangular lattice. And if we, we, we draw up the points like that, we see we're, we're, we're sort of covering the plane with lots of rectangles whose vertices are lattice points. So principal ideals are rectangular. Um, well, what about a non-principal ideal? What does that look like? Well, a typical non-principal ideal is 2, 1 plus root minus 5. That means the, 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 the um, ideal generated by these two numbers here. So let's draw a picture of it. So let's first draw the ring um, z root minus 5. So here's 0, 2, 1 root minus 5. And the ideal is going to contain, well it contains 0 and 2 and it contains 1 plus root minus 5 and it also contains these and it contains this number here and this number here and so on. And if you draw all its points you find you get a sort of lattice looking like this. It's kind of diamond shaped, not rectangular in some sense. And just as before, if we take um, any multiple of this by a complex number, we, we will also get a diamond shaped lattice, except it will be rotated and rescaled a bit. So the um, non principal ideals kind of look different from the principal ideals. They're, they're, they're diamond lattices rather than rectangular lattices. I mean, in fact, for this particular ring, this is all the ideals. Every ideal either looks like this one or it's a principal ideal. Um, of course, for more complicated um, unique factorization domains, sorry, more complicated things that aren't unique factorization domains, you can get many different um, shapes of ideals. Um, People doing algebraic number theory are very interested in the different shapes of ideals and the number of different shapes of ideals is called the, the class number of the quadratic field and they spend a lot of time calculating it. Um, okay, that's all for this lecture. Next lecture will be about localization of rings.